in the cloud. Okay. All right, so we've got our recording in progress. Uh, and we're actually going to just jump right into the program tonight uh, because Eddie, uh, he is the gentleman in the green shirt. He's over here to me. I don't know where he is on your screen. Um, but Eddie uh, is going to be has a bunch of really cool stuff to talk to you about tonight. And I don't wanna cut into any of his time. Uh, as for questions, if you can uh, kind of wait until the end uh, to ask questions. Go on. So that we can just so far. Yeah. Moving forward. Let me just mute that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so just like a, Eddie's gonna basically introduce himself, um, but I just want you guys to know that he is a, a really cool uh, guy. He does a bunch of stuff with uh, mushrooms and community gardens, including the Commonwealth uh, Garden in Frankfurt and the Thornhill Garden. Uh, and uh, I've really enjoyed getting to learn about mushrooms and plants from him. Uh, and so I think you guys are really going to enjoy this session. Uh, and so I'm just gonna now move it on over to Eddie so you can get, get talking. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, with everybody so we can go ahead and get started. Okay, uh, give me a second. I need to minimize uh, the video over here. It's going to get very distracting for me if I can't see things. There we go. Looks better. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, Welcome to uh, Mushroom Identification for Beginners. Uh, this is really a beginner's class. I am assuming that you either don't know um, anything about mushrooms or you were just uh, starting your mushroom identification. And if, you know, if you've been identifying mushrooms for a while, a lot of this isn't gonna be new. Uh, so it's gonna be pretty good, uh, but it's still good to kind of rehash some things. So we'll get on with the presentation. Hi, uh, my name is Eddie um, Fowler and I started my foray into the mycological world uh, learning how to actually grow gourmet mushrooms on outdoor logs in 2015. Uh, since then, my interest has uh, really grown um, in mycology uh, past just the edibility of mushrooms and, the, and onto their role in nature and the niches that they fill. For the past uh, two years, I've been working on uh, starting a commercial indoor grow operation uh, for gourmet mushrooms and uh, a gardening education center that will have a mycological component. At the same time, I have been recently in the past, I'd say two, two years as well, um, been uh, slowly going through wanting to learn more about wild mushrooms and identifying basically every mushroom that I can find that I come across. I, my phone is filled uh, with mushroom pictures that I have yet to identify, but I'm just slowly going through them. Um, and I like learning about their um, functioning, uh, their part in actually a functioning ecological systems. I wanted us, this is kind of a disclaimer here. Uh, this presentation is uh, meant as an introduction to mycology and mushroom identification. I will not be discussing the edibility of mushrooms during this talk. If you are interested in learning uh, more about foraging for mushrooms, please see the resources page. And it is strongly recommended finding a mentor who has experience in foraging. Um, a couple of helpful hints uh, for uh, foraging that I'm just gonna say here is, do not consume any mushroom unless you are 100% sure of its species. Uh, this is important. Uh, there are a few species that are deadly for human consumption and even more that will just make you sick. Uh, and I just wanna say that with Disclaimer, you are responsible for your own safety while um, mushroom foraging. All right, let's get started with a few terms. Uh, the most basic term, uh, maybe some of you have heard of mycology, uh, maybe some of you haven't, um, but mycology is the scientific study of uh, the fungi kingdom. Um, and uh, what fungi is, is a group of spore producing organisms that feed on organic matter. This includes yeast, molds, and mushrooms. Uh, you know, you all remember from your years in grade school or even in college where they talked about the different uh, branches of life. Um, and the fungi are their its own kingdom. It's a fairly broad kingdom. You know, it's one of those things that not all 
fungi produce mushrooms, but all mushrooms are fungi, um, you know, that kind of deal. Uh, another term is that you'll see thrown around a lot is mycelium. And this is the vegetative body of uh, fungi created by a group of a filament called the hyphae. Um, and this is all, and these are the things that, um, uh, it's basically white threads or brown threads, depending on the color of the mushroom. Um, depending on the type of mushroom it is, it can be different color, but it's mostly white is what you'll see. Um, and a group of hyphae is just the mycelium structure. And mushrooms, even though it's not a scientific term, it's such a well-known term. Um, it is actually the reproductive part of some funguses, fungi that uh, produce the spores. Uh, so uh, the way I now this part to like going to um, plants is say you have a tomato plant. The tomato is actually the mushroom. This is the body that actually holds the seeds. The mycelium would be everything else, the roots and the uh, the plant itself. I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through the life cycle of a mushroom producing uh, fungi. It's kind of a circle, you know, chicken before the egg uh, type story, but uh, let's kind of go through. Uh, you have start with the mature mushroom, and this is kind of an ideal um, scenario where we're dealing with a, a gilled mushroom, and we'll kind of reference those later. Um, and the gill, on the gills, you have these uh, basidia producing spore structures. Um, and these structures will either eject or let go of the spores and the spores will either be carried away by wind or insect or some other means um, to a substrate. And you can see the, you know, the spores will land on a substrate and given the right conditions, the right substrate, you will end up getting a spore uh, germination. Um, and they will be producing a filament called the hyphae, as I referenced earlier. Uh, and once you have the hyphae grow and you have enough hyphae, it's just a group, and then you have the mycelium. Uh, and once you get to a certain point, you have the right conditions, right humidity, right temperature, um, the right light can be a factor in producing it, it'll start forming a hyphal knot. And this is uh, where you start developing the primordial, uh, primordia mushroom development. So this is just the very beginning stages of the mushroom. And then you go into, once again, the mature uh, mushroom that will actually spread and produce the spores. I thought uh, for identification, it's kind of useful to kind of go through um, the anatomy of a mushroom uh, for this, uh, this drawing that I did is kind of an amalgamation of several different mushrooms. This isn't, um, but I thought I, it's useful to have kind of all the details to kind of say, oh, does this mushroom have this? Or what other um, literature that you're reading uh, will have these, some of these terms. So we'll start with the top of the mushroom uh, that is referred to as the cap. Uh, the cap uh, can have uh, spots, it can be smooth. Uh, usually, if it has spots, uh, a lot of times these are remnants of the universal veil of the mushroom. Another important part of identifying mushrooms is kind of paying attention to the margin of the cap. Uh, these are the edges. It can have little fibers or how the gills attach the margin or roll up. Um, then you have the underside of the cap, which is usually a spore, um, is referred to as a spore bearing surface. And that is uh, gilled or it can contain pores. Um, now the stem typically here is uh, called a stipe or a stem. You know, you can refer to either. Um, and, you know, it can have uh, uh, several marks. You want to pay attention uh, to all these details, whether or not it's smooth, whether it's hollow, uh, brittle, ribbed. Um, and another part that is usually on the uh, top of the, uh, on the stipe of the mushroom is a ring or annulus. Uh, this is the remains of the partial veil um, of the mushroom. And the partial veil, the reason why it's only a partial veil is because it will cover, it's a cover of the pore bearing surface of the mushroom. And it's typically only on, uh, I don't wanna say only, it's on gilled mushrooms a lot because it's used to protect the gills. 
Uh, and then finally, you want to also take a look at the base of the mushroom. And this may require digging up the mushroom to actually see these features, um, uh, mostly for the universal veil. Uh, once the mushroom is out of it, they usually end up calling it the vulva. Um, this is a prominent feature for a genus of mushrooms called the Amanita mushrooms. Uh, and that is a very big group of mushrooms, but it's a very fascinating group of mushrooms. I'm not going to go over this, but there's a lot of terms uh, on the right hand side where you have the shape of the cap and how the gills attach to the stalk or the shape of the stalk and the position of the stalk are all important that can help you identify and narrow down what kind of mushroom uh, you actually have. So what do mushrooms eat? Well, that's kind of a trick question. Um, mushrooms are actually the reproductive part of the fungus, if you remember. And the mycelium is what would be considered the vegetative part of the fungus. Mycelium excrete enzymes that digest the substrate to extract the nutrients that the fungi need. Uh, there are three types of fungi substrate relationships. Um, there are mycorrhizal, these fungi form a symbiotic relationship with their host uh, as a plant or tree. Um, uh, this allows for the exchange of resources uh, from the host to the symbiote. Uh, this is like the mushroom will give off phosphorus, nitrogen, and water, uh, while the tree will in return give the, um, the mycelium the sugars. Uh, there is a saprophytic uh, uh, fungi. Uh, these fungi are considered secondary composters. Uh, they grow on dead and decaying matter, such as dead wood, dung, grasses, leaves. Uh, there is also a uh, parasitic fungi, and these actively attack their hosts, either by consuming the lignus structure of uh, the tree or the plant that they're on, or taking more nutrients than they give in return. And all these uh, types of mushrooms are not mutually exclusive. Uh, you can have a mushroom that is parasitic and also is saprophytic. Uh, you can have a parasitic and mycorrhizal mushroom. It just depends on the condition and the type of relationship that uh, the fungi has with um, its substrate. Now, uh, this, this is kind of a, a, a nuanced discussion, and I think it's kind of important to get into. Uh, it's using binomials, and binomials are technically the scientific name of um, species. Uh, so, uh, while common names might be easy, and I'll throw out a lot of common names here and there, and it's kind of just general terms, but when you're going to identify things on a species level, it's always best to use a binomial. And of course, I just want to give you a structure. You have the genus, uh, uh, and uh, going first, the genus of, this, uh, of the particular specimen, go first, and that's usually capitalized, followed by the species name and that will be lowercase. Here are a few examples. Uh, you have two mushrooms that are known as chicken of the woods, um, but they are two separate um, species. Uh, you have Latioporus cincinnatius, uh, Latioporus uh, sulfurius, uh, and then of course there's the destroying angel. You have that, this is actually a name that, common name that I shared across a lot of mushrooms, but uh, here are two different species that share the same common name. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about pronouncing the binomials correctly. Um, it's Greek and Roman. Um, it's a dead language. You're going to be listening to me probably butcher a lot of these names. So um, I just want to, you know, if you ever think that you're, you know, going through it and you're not saying it right, just remember this talk and how I mispronounced all these names. Uh, another thing in uh, mushrooms that's kind of important to pay t attention to is uh, uh, synonyms and name changes. This happens frequently, especially as uh, um, the scientists and mycologists get more uh, detailed um, information about mushrooms, especially with uh, uh, when they start DNA, uh, DNA analysis of the mushrooms. Uh, I just want to let you know that um, that that old 1970s field guide uh, might not have the most current scientific name of the species. And even on that pamphlet, I, uh, I looked through some of the names on the pamphlet and I was able to see that they don't have the most current um, uh, on that field guide that you were given for this presentation. Um, it doesn't even have, for a few mushrooms, it doesn't even have the correct name, uh, most current name on it. 
Um, so an example is these are the two most recent accepted names for this uh, mushroom, the Pisces batius and uh, Roeporus batius. Uh, you know, it was a, originally called the Polyporus batius. In the same way with the Astro Boletus uh, batella. Um, and I look, won't go through all the names, but these are all synonyms for the name. So if you have an old field guide, you don't have to throw it out. Just realize that you might have to, you know, do a little bit of internet sleuthing to see if that is the current name. I wanted to share a little bit of trivia with you. Uh, you know, the brown capped portobello mushrooms and the white capped mushrooms, uh, button mushrooms that you have at the uh, store, uh, they are basically the same mushroom, the agaricus by spores. Um, they are, it's just a marketing thing. Uh, they are exactly the same species, they just have different morphologies and how they present themselves. Okay, now we can start getting into uh, some of the things, uh, nuances of uh, mushroom identification. Uh, when trying to ID a mushroom, uh, it is really important that you uh, make an observation of your surroundings and the environment that that mushroom is. You want to start paying attention to small details. Um, so, uh, you know, things like you can have a field guide or a field notebook, and I always I don't always have a field notebook, but I'll have a phone with me and I'll write down certain things uh, like the location and you want to get down to at least uh, the city or state um, uh, to get a proper identification for some mushrooms uh, or region. Uh, you want to get the date or time of year, summer, fall, winter, spring, the habitat of the mushroom, whether or not it's growing on lawns, pastures, old growth forest, mulch. Um, and other things. Uh, if it's growing on a tree or near a tree, what kind of tree is that? Uh, uh, you know, whether or not it's conifer, uh, broadleaf, oak, and pine. And this is a kind of important uh, kind of relationship between trees and mushrooms. Some mushrooms are very particular about the type of tree. Some will only associate with oaks, and some will only associate with a, a black locust. Um, is a very common one that you'll see around here growing on black locust. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it typically only goes on black locust, so you're able to easily identify that one. Um, also note the smell of the mushroom, whether or not it's foul or it has a pleasant smell or it's just completely neutral. All these things can definitely help you uh, later on when you're wanting to actually try to get a species identification for a mushroom. Uh, you want to know the range and habitat of the mushrooms. A lot of field guides and everything, um, and online, they'll let you know whether or not a mushroom uh, grows in a specific um, area. Um, many, this is kind of a nuanced discussion, but many fungi species that are in North America also have uh, very similar or the same species in Europe uh, elsewhere that use different binomials. So it's this can be very confusing. Uh, don't get too bogged down into it. Just notice that if you try to use one name, just notice whether or not it's in a North American species or if it's a European species. Uh, so I just also wanted to make note, um, you may have seen, oh, go back, uh, advertised for this um, class. Uh, there is a bright red mushroom with white specks on the cap. This is a well-known mushroom and it is called Amanita muscaria. And this mushroom, actually doesn't, this uh, variety, that variety, the red cap, specifically the red cap uh, Amanita muscaria, does not grow in this region. There is a variety of that mushroom, um, Amanita muscaria uh, variety, uh, Gassawi, uh, uh that does grow in here, uh, in this region. Also, there are other species of fungi that you can find on the west coast that are not on the east uh, that are not east of the Rocky Mountains. The, it seems like sometimes the Rocky Mountains um, ends up making a big divide. And so uh, they'll make note of that in many field guides. And an example of this is, uh, um, is this Ladioporus uh, Gilbert Sane, Sanei. Um, uh, this mushroom grows on the West Coast on oak trees and uh, eucalyptus trees. Uh, but it does not grow on the east, even though we have those two other uh, Latiopora species mushrooms. 
Uh, now, uh, if you're wanting to kind of go to uh, the internet or any of the um, uh, take pictures for trying to ID them and you don't want to take specimens with you, uh, it, it is important to note that uh, most apps um, uh, like plant ID apps like iNaturalist, they're not great at identifying mushrooms because typically you need more than one picture to properly identify a mushroom. And some um, mushrooms won't even give you, um, you won't be able to tell on a macro scale what that mush, the specific species of the mushroom is because their nuanced details are in the microscopic level. So uh, this first picture here um, is of a Ganoderma species. I can tell by looking at it. Um, that's that, but I don't know anything else about it. I don't know if it's uh, the courteous eye or um, the Cecil uh, mushrooms. Uh, and this one down here is just a beautiful picture of the caps, but I don't know whether or not it's a guild or a, a, a polypore mushroom. So you want to be able to identify these mushrooms. So here is a couple examples of how you can take uh, pictures of mushrooms. Um, this one is a common yard mushroom, the uh, chlorophyllum molybites. Um, and the way that you can kind of take a picture is uh, if you have multiple specimens, you can take one and turn it upside down and put it next to the other ones. And that can give you um, an information enough to get an ID on it. Uh, this other one, Amanita abrupta, you know, took a picture of the caps. Uh, then you dig it up a little bit and you'll have this nice little basal universal veil, uh, remains of a universal veil structure here. Um, and then also a cross section, didn't necessarily need the cross section, um, but it's always useful to kind of see if there's any other details that are uh, more nuanced with the specimen that you have. Uh, now, uh, if you're going to kind of other ID groups on Facebook or anything, they'll really want a lot of more detailed pictures um, when it gets to certain, uh, certain species of mushrooms, if you're wanting to just try to identify everything like I am. Um, so here are a couple of uh, ways that you can get success with ID with photos, um, is you want a detailed picture of the cap. Uh, you know, what color is, the details, the texture, and all this, uh, anything, uh, how the margins look, you also want a picture of the mushroom in its original environment, whether or not it's connected to a tree. I see a lot of pictures of people who've brought home mushrooms uh, and they're completely out of context. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether or not it was, what kind of tree it was attached to or whether or not it was growing on grass uh, or whether or not it was in a conifer forest versus a broadleaf forest. You want a picture of the mushroom base. This is always important. It's not always present, but there's few species that will have some underground structure that will uh, be important to identify. Um, a lot of species will also want um, a detailed pitch species of mushroom, really like cross sections uh, because these will um, uh, stay, they'll bruise uh, and stain black and blue. Or, and you also want to take note of sometimes how long it takes for it to stay. Um, and you also sometimes want to get a detail of whether or not the stem is hollow or the cap's hollow. How deep are the pores on these mushrooms? Uh, and finally, of course, you want to get detailed pictures of the spore bearing surface of the mushroom. Uh, how does the stipe attach to the cap of the mushroom? Or whether or not it's a, a, a gilled mushroom or a cord mushroom, uh, whether or not there's a universe, uh, a partial veil on the mushroom. All these things are kind of details that are really important that you want to get on a mushroom. Uh, these are uh, kind of more specialized and more advanced stuff, but I kind of wanted to talk about them a little bit. Um, it is spore prints, um, doing a chemical test and microscopic features of mushrooms. They, they can help you identify, but these are fairly advanced uh, topics. Um, uh, the spores of mushrooms, they come in all shapes and colors. Uh, sometimes it is useful to get uh, an ID, uh, to get an ID is to uh, get a spore print of the mushroom. And I'll have on the next page, I actually have details on how you can do a spore print. It's not hard at all. It's actually really fun. I like 
you can use it as art or, you know, it's just, it's a really cool thing to learn how to do a spore print. Uh, now for the chemical test, the typical, typical chemical is uh, potassium hydroxide. And how does the cap or other features uh, stain when subjected uh, to this uh, chemical base? Now all the spores um, uh, for each species of mushroom, they can, they can, um, they can uh, differ dramatically and uh, they are on a microscopic level. And this is, uh, you know, this is something, if you have a microscope, sometimes you might wanna just examine and look at them. They're pretty neat uh, to learn about this, uh, but it's, once again, this is an advanced topic. Um, so uh, we'll move on to other things. Now I wanted to go through making a spore print. Uh, what you want to do is step one, you want to have the mushrooms. And step two, you want to remove the stalks of the mushroom so it can lay flat on the paper or the media that you are. You can even use glass, uh, aluminum foil or anything like that right here. And then you want to cover it in a way that it limits the amount of current that uh, or wind that is blowing on the mushroom. You don't want to have a fan right next to it. Otherwise, it's going to take you forever and you're probably not going to have good spore print. Um, and step four, you turn them over and you can kind of see um, the spore print. This was only done for an hour, so the spore prints are fairly light. You can, kind of, you can see this being a brown spore print. This one is a little bit more rusty. This one is a pink spore print. I just know that one because of the species. Um, but it's, it's fairly light. Um, okay, uh, now uh, many field guides and um, information online, a lot of them use uh, keys for um, identifying mushrooms. This will help you very early on and even as you continue to uh, define new mushrooms or as you find a new mushroom, this will help you uh, kind of narrow down what kind of mushroom it is. Uh, and these uh, keys rely on dichotomous statements, basically meaning you have two statements that will branch off and take you on different routes depending on the specimen that you have in front of you. But with, uh, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure, but you're trying to reach a, um, an already, you're trying to reach the answer instead of having all these questions. Uh, you follow the questions to get to what you already have. Uh, this uh, the key was taken from mushrooms of West Virginia and the central Appalachia. So uh, I think this one was applied mostly to uh, guild mushrooms. Uh, so essentially you have two uh, one statements, these two individual statements right here that are grouped. And you'll determine whether or not one of these is true for the specimen that you have. And so say that uh, the stock was central or eccentric, meaning that it was slightly off, then you would go on to two. Uh, this other one takes you to a different section in the book, which is on a different page. So you would go to that section. Uh, so you'd go to the two statement. If it was a stock with a conspicuous membrous or a continent, cottony ring, then you go to the three statements and then so on and so forth until you get to the place where it says, uh, the, it's potentially this species. So uh, I kind of wanted to, I'm, this is kind of like uh, uh, off topic, but I just kind of wanted to go over these uh, fungi. They're really neat. Uh, these are uh, pathogenic fungi. Uh, a lot of people like studying these type of funguses, especially since they cause pathogens and crops and other things like that. But uh, a pretty famous um, enthopomathic a pathogenic uh, mushroom, which means that it'll infect um, insects, is a uh, Cordyceps uh, militaris. And this mushroom infects the, um, uh, the pupae or the caterpillar form of uh, certain moths and things like that. And you can see the orange tip growing out of it in uh, this. There's other mushrooms like these two mushrooms uh, that will actually um, in fact, uh, uh, it's a fungus that'll infect another fungus. Uh, and a pretty famous one is the Hypomyces uh, lactiflorium. Uh, if you were around for the, uh, the 17 year uh, cicadas this spring, uh, you would have heard a lot of stories about this particular fungus. Um, we actually found this one on my driveway. It's a uh, Massospora uh, cicadina. 
Um, and this one actually uh, infects the, set, the periodic cicadas. And it essentially um, is a, a fungus. It's, a, it's not a mushroom producing fungus, but it's just a spore producing fungus that is transmitted kind of like an STD for cicadas. Uh, if you've walked around Kentucky and cedar forests, forests at all, you have definitely seen uh, uh, this orange glob on cedar trees. Um, uh, this is a, a, a gymnosporadium, a species. Otherwise, it's, the common name is cedar apple rust. This is partly why apples kind of have a lot of problems growing in this region. Uh, another famous one is uh, this um, Eustilago um, species of mushrooms. It is a, uh, also known as a corn smut. Uh, I also want to kind of go into this uh, fungi. So uh, if you're not familiar uh, with this one, it is the species of fungi that actually wiped out the American chestnut. Um, so the, you know, these uh, fungi is, are they're generally everywhere and they kind of uh, have substrate and hosts on everything, but this is kind of just talking about general um, pathogenic uh, fungi. Um, these usually don't produce mushrooms. Uh, okay, so even though I said we wouldn't talk about um, uh, the edibility of mushrooms, I thought it was still important that if you're getting in the field and wanting to identify mushrooms, this is talk about there's actually mushrooms that are deadly for humans to consume. Uh, the three examples right now um, are that I have right here are the Amanita biosporangia and the Amanita phyllides and Gallerina um, marginata. So these mushrooms will actually cause liver and kidney failure um, in humans. And also, you know, if you have kids or dogs in your yard and you just happen to see uh, these type of mushrooms, they're really neat mushrooms, but you know, you just want to keep, uh, you know, keep them from being consumed, essentially. Now, uh, but, uh, now we'll start getting into other detailed speci uh, species that are in this area. And when you start discussing the species, you want to start looking. Uh, there's a thing that is called lookalikes. And these are mushrooms that uh, look like each other, but are a different species. So you want to be aware that this is a thing in mycology and mushroom um, identification. Uh, so uh, these pictures are, you'll see why they uh, come through, but my wife uh, did these drawings uh, in the spring and I just thought I would put in here. Uh, the famous ones are you have morels and false morels. Uh, mor the morel family is the Morcella species. Uh, these are usually deep um, veined and grooved uh, species of mushrooms. Uh, there's a lot of species within this genus, um, but they are also typically characterized by um, how, uh, so it's important to remember, I said, you wanna get sometimes a cross section of the mushroom and how it looks, but you know, uh, the Marcella species usually have a hollow stem. Um, then you have the Gyromitra species. Uh, this is what you would call the false morel. Um, and this one is, uh, I don't know the species of it, but I just want to make note that usually this species will have um, more lob lobular features and lobes compared to the Morcella species. And there's also the Helvella species. Um, this is a picture I took of what I thought was a Helvella crispa, um, but it could have also been Helvella uh, sulcata. Um, and the difference between those is actually on the fine hairs on the underside of the cap. So I wouldn't be able to, I, I don't have the specimen of this mushroom anymore. So I didn't get it down to the species level, but uh, you know, these are kind of details that you want to start getting into when you want to start uh, IDing more mushrooms. An another famous one that's around here everywhere is the uh, uh, Tremates, Tremates uh, varus color, uh, versicolor. Um, and this is commonly known as turkey tail and false turkey tail. 
Uh, turkey tails, um, from what I've read, has also been applied to anything that kind of looks like a turkey tail in the tray meat species. Um, uh, so I took this key actually from um, the website mushroomexpert.com and Michael Quo, he actually goes through the details of it. But, you know, essentially you want to look at the uh, porous surface of the mushroom. Is it white? Okay, it's white. Are the, is the top of it um, have hair on it uh, and is uh, fairly felty? Uh, then yes, okay. That's another thing you want to look at. Uh, but then there's also nuanced things has in uh, how many spores are actually on the mushroom. So the uh, turkey, uh, the tray meats, uh, tray meats uh, varus color has three to eight uh, pores per millimeter. So you want to look at these very small details sometimes. And another one is uh, a lookalike of the turkey tail is the uh, uh, Sterium um, austria. Um, austri. uh, and this is actually a crust fungus, but you can tell by its fan shape and the pore bearing surface. Um, it actually looks very similar to the top, but it doesn't have a white surface like the turkey tail. Uh, so we haven't really uh, talked about this much, but there's, a, you know, we talked mostly about gilled mushrooms, um, uh, but there are uh, polypore mushrooms. And I kind of wanted to go into uh, a few species of mushrooms that kind of all look like each other that are actually um, in this region. So you have um, Maripolis uh, substenii, uh, substeni. I always get that wrong. Um, this one is also called the black staining polypore. Uh, the one that the identifying characteristic of this mushroom is that it will have a brown, gray to white body, um, but the edges of it, when bruised, will stain brown and black. Um, there is also uh, this uh, Berkeley species of mushroom that uh, have these very large fronds um, or uh, caps that kind of look like kidneys. And these can reach up sometimes to sizes of two feet in diameter. Um, you know, a lot of the, all these mushrooms kind of share uh, the same ecological, ecological niche. Um, they are parasitic to saprophytic uh, with their hosts. So they are either killing it or decaying its remains. Uh, this one is, you know, we talked about this one, this species of mushroom is Latioporus species. Um, but the uh, defining characteristic of this is that it will cluster, it doesn't form on like a clump, kind of like all the other species here. And the uh, cap tops end up being orange and yellow um, or orange and white. Uh, and the pore spore, uh, spore bearing, spore bearing surface of the mushroom um, is either yellow in the sulfurous case or white in the Cincinnatius case. Uh, another one that is commonly grown in this area, and they kind of, uh, all these are kind of uh, growing at this time of year as well, is Grifola uh, frondosa. Um, and this one um, is a, the, the caps of these uh, mushrooms, they are tinier. And one of the things that you want to make note on these mushrooms is that the pore surface, uh, the pores are typically one, three angular pores per millimeter. So, you know, it's important to get these details. So you can see there are different morphologies for all these type of mushrooms and how they express themselves. But, um, you know, you wanna be able to make um, the distinction um, for these. Uh, so many mushrooms, as I mentioned before, uh, have teeny tiny differences. Uh, some mushrooms are impos impossible to ID. Uh, down to a species level without microscopic equipment. Uh, this is the case for several red cap uh, Rosella uh, species. Uh, if you ever, this is uh, in front yards everywhere. When I go hiking, it's on the side of trails. I see it everywhere. I make note, that's a Rosella, a red cap Rosella. I usually move on because I, you know, I'll look at the bottom of it, the surface to see if I'm just not making sure of it, but uh, another note, they're also called um, brittle, um, either brittle caps or brittle gills, uh, and specifically because if you rub your fingers on them, uh, the gills break apart really easily. 
Um, so these are all four species uh, that would be referred to as red cap rosella, but some of them actually need microscopic um, analysis to determine the species. Uh, now I wanted to go into some common uh, yard and garden mushrooms. Uh, so you have the, uh, I saw, uh, this is a picture that you've seen a couple times in the presentation. It's a chlorophyllum um, molybdites, molybdites. It's a, it's a tricky word. Uh, it is typically growing on uh, lawns. Uh, it has a green spore print and it has usually an annulus attached to the stipe. It also has a textured cap. Um, and this mushroom is, uh, and I, you know, once again, not talking about the edibility of mushrooms, but I will say this mushroom is also known as the vomiter. Um, and so it can also be very toxic for animals. So if you have this growing in your yard, it might be useful. If you, are, you have an animal that just eats things, it might be useful to actually remove this species from your yard once you see it growing. Uh, this is another uh, fun species of mushroom. Uh, they're uh, affectionately referred to as stinkhorns. Uh, the mutinous species have foul order, odor. Uh, this particular species uh, uh, will develop yellow, orange, or red color with a brown spore slime uh, that develops on the tips. Uh, so the, these species is either uh, mutinous uh, elegans or mutinous uh, 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 ravenelli. Eye. And it is, uh, yeah, so I wasn't able to kind of get the details to actually get it to whether or not it is one or the other. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that when you see these, they have a foul odor. You can smell them from uh, several feet away. Um, another one is uh, Leo uh, Leico uh, agaricus americanus. Uh, this is usually found in mulch beds. Uh, they have white gills that stain uh, reddish brown with age and bruising. They actually have took some gills off and pressed on it with my fingers. And you can actually see kind of the reddish uh, bruising around it. And it also has a textured cap, but you'll have white gills on this mushroom. Uh, you'll see them in flower beds everywhere. This one, I took a picture right next to my work that was in a rose bed. Uh, I, this mushroom, I kind of wanted to point it out because it's been coming out a lot, is uh, um, Omphalotus uh, ludens. It is a gill mushroom grow, uh, found growing on clusters at the base of stumps and dying trees. It's late summer to fall. Uh, the common name is the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Uh, the gills are uh, close to compact and decurrent. The uh, decurrent means is that the gills will actually go down the stipe instead of ending at the stipe or not being attached to the stipe. That's just a, you know, a mycological term that is used a lot. Uh, this is one of the mushrooms that is supposedly uh, bioluminescent. So if you end up finding these species, you can take it uh, uh, into a bathroom and, you know, uh, in a closed, dark room and try to stare at it for a while. I haven't seen it yet. Um, people say they've seen it. I've seen pictures of people taking long exposures of it, but it is, uh, you know, I've yet to see it. I want to see it. Uh, I hope to do it and try it in the future again. Um, before I ever start kind of really getting um, um, educating myself more on mushroom identification. I would also often pick up the uh, eludens uh, on a hike thinking it was either uh, of the chanterelle species or an oyster mushroom. And upon further inspection, I, you, I, could, I would always notice my error. Now that I have been IDing mushrooms, uh, it, you know, uh, this mushroom is pretty uh, unmistakable once you uh, get familiar with it. Um, and yeah, I just want to talk about the Cantharellus uh, species. Uh, these, uh, even though their seasons overlap, um, uh, the commonly known as chanterelles, they don't grow in clumps uh, as much as the uh, Luton species does. Uh, and the biggest feature of the Cantharellus species is that they have what is known as false gills. Now, with the Luton species, the gills are attached to the cap, but you can easily separate them from the cap of the mushroom. The false gills are not, you can't separate them from the cap of the mushroom. They're actually technically part of the cap of the mushroom. 
Uh, this is another fun uh, species of mushroom that you might overlook and think that it might be just a rock or something, but this is a cal uh, Calvadia uh, giganate. Um, got giganate. Um, it's a saprotic uh, growing on the ground of meadows, forest floor, alone or gregariously. You can have gregarious just means there's several of them around. Uh, it's late summer to fall. It's shaped like a ball, oblong sphere, and it can actually get uh, larger than 50 centimeters wide. Uh, it is uh, when uh, when young, it is solid white all the way through, turning to a greenish brownish. It has it ages and is ready to um, release spores. When it's young, it has a very neutral spell, uh, smell. Here's a picture of me holding um, one of the specimen of this. Um, that's a young one. And uh, this one is a specimen of this uh, same mushroom, um, but it is a few, it, this one's definitely past its prime and it smells fairly foul. And that's why my wife is holding it that way. And the dog is not pleased. Either. Uh, this one, I really like this mushroom. I'm really fond of this one. It's a Ganoderma appellatum. It's uh, uh, commonly referred to as the artist conch, as saprotic and sometimes parasitic, growing on dead woods and dying trees. Um, it has a spore bearing surface that can be scratched uh, to make art. Thus, uh, you know, that's the name. So, you know, every so often, I don't really pick these mushrooms. I just like scraping on the bottom of the mushroom. So every so often you, when you're out in the woods looking for a mushroom, you might see a little message from me. Uh, I, this, I don't wanna go into great details about this mushroom because I am by no means, I am a complete novice. And uh, I'll be honest, I, this one is kind of difficult to me and I'm just starting to now be comfortable enough to where I want to get into more identification of boletes. And boletes is just a term that is used to describe several genera of mushrooms. Uh, the defining characteristic is that they are polypore mushrooms, the central stock. Uh, and here are several um, uh, genre of the mushrooms, the boletus, uh, the lacinium, um, uh, tylopilus, um, are a few of the um, genus of mushrooms. Uh, and also, uh, this is one that I found. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is in the Boletus um, genus of mushroom, but I didn't go into much detail other than note that I did a cross section and noticed that it was black staining uh, when it was scored and bruised. Uh, this is one of my favorite mushrooms. Uh, this is the uh, Herisium aranaceus. Um, it is a two-type mushroom it is, that is both uh, saprotic and parasitic, growing in late summer and fall. Uh, it's growing alone or sometimes in groups on uh, hardwood. Uh, the fruit body is constructed of a clump that produces uh, spore-bearing hair-like spines, and it uh, discolors to brown and yellow when aging. Um, this is uh, one of the species of um, Herisia marinaceus that I actually cultivated and grew myself. Um, I just think it's a really cool mushroom. If you want to know more about it, I suggest researching it a little bit further. Uh, this one, uh, I actually had never noticed this species before, and I just recently noticed it, and I took these pictures of them. It is the Rhodotus. Uh, palmatus. Um, it's a saprotic uh, mushroom growing on uh, dead logs. Uh, it has a showy pink cap with ridges and wrinkles and peak gills. It has no ring on the stipe. Uh, young specimens will sometimes have this red gutations on the stem and usually uh, gutations is just a fancy word for secretions. Um, and I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it might be just uh, metabolic fluid that comes out of the mushroom. But uh, here's an older specimen. You can see how uh, the wrinkles and ridges on the cap kind of uh, start to fade out as it ages. Uh, now, there are so many uh, genre of mushrooms that it's, it'd be kind of ridiculous for me to get them all in an hour talk. And I just kind of wanted to give everybody a overview of some of the uh, genre of mushrooms that are in our region, uh, just in case you want to research them further. Uh, you know, once again, you have the Amanita mushrooms, uh, uh, the Rhodus uh, mushrooms, uh, 
uh, the uh, Cordonarius mushrooms. Uh, this one's a pretty cool mushroom because I'm waiting to find my first Lactarius indigo mushroom. Uh, I think these mushrooms are super cool. They're otherwise known as uh, milk cap mushrooms because they produce a white um, latex when you actually cut into them or bruise them or damage them. Uh, this one will actually sometimes produce a blue latex, uh, but I, you know, I just want to make note of this. You also have a crapanoid, uh, uh, not crapanoid, uh, copernoid uh, mushrooms. Uh, these mushrooms are called ink caps for a reason. As they age, their spores start to liquefy and turn into a black ooze. And this is another thing that you can do with these mushrooms is that you can actually take um, the, uh, the liquefied ink uh, the, uh, and uh, actually use it as an ink. You can actually write with it. And, you know, uh, can, another neat thing that you can do with the mushrooms. Uh, you know, I also talked about the Ganoderma mushrooms, of course, the Ganoderma apalatum mushrooms, but you'll also see uh, these lacquered shelf mushrooms all um, throughout the area. And it's usually, you know, they're usually on dying trees, which is sad, but um, uh, you know that they're, they're they're just really neat mushrooms. I kind of just want to make note of it. Uh, uh, I want to say I brought in coral fungi. Um, these are you know once again several genre of mushrooms uh, that you can produce and can find them. And I just wanted to let people know that you know when you see something that kind of looks like a fungal uh, or a coral mushroom that you can look it up. Uh, it's just a term that you can use to try to narrow down your search so you're not having to go through everything. And there is, of course, also jelly fungi that is in this region. Um, how many times have you seen this yellow jelly that's on it? That's you know, People uh, affectionately refer to as witch's butter. Um, and, you know, you also have uh, this other one that's commonly referred to as ligier. Another one that I've just started recently seeing is the gastrium uh, mushroom. These are known as earth star mushrooms. They're really neat. Uh, and I like just kind of IDing these mushrooms. And this is no, by no means a comprehensive list. There are so many mushrooms uh, that uh, it would be ridiculous for me to put together a comprehensive list of mushrooms that are in our uh, region for an hour presentation. Okay, kind of wanted to go through some uh, resources uh, that you can use. Uh, of course, uh, I, this presentation itself relied heavily on um, mushroomexpert.com on a few things, uh, but they have, uh, uh, their front page actually has an index of a lot of mushrooms and they go through, um, uh, Michael Quo actually goes through a lot of detail on mushrooms and uh, I highly recommend going through this website and kind of getting familiar with it. Uh, to get into more, uh, because it's such a, long, a large uh, genus of mushroom, uh, the Amanita species, uh, there's actually a group that have their own website that's dedicated to just IDing Amanita mushrooms. Uh, other helpful places to help you with ID, if you're running into problems or you just wanna post pictures of cold mushrooms you found, uh, I recommend joining the Bluegrass Mycological uh, Society. Uh, they have a Facebook page. And there's also the official uh, Kentucky Mushroom Facebook page. Um, people post there, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, interesting talk about edibility of mushroom. I kind of mostly ignore most of that stuff because uh, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm iffy about telling people just based on a few pictures about the edibility of mushrooms. Uh, uh, so, and then there's also a mushroomobserver.org, which is a nonprofit website uh, that you can go to, and it's just a collection of mushrooms uh, that is, you know, you can detail it down to your region. I've even started posting on it. Um, if you are interested in actually learning about foraging for mushrooms, uh, I uh, posted a link to uh, several workshops and certifications uh, that is hosted by uh, Mountain, uh, Mushroom Mountain. Uh, it is a business out of uh, South Carolina and several states in our area. They actually require certification. If you want to sell mushrooms at a market or if you want to sell them to restaurants, they require certifications uh, to be able to sell those mushrooms because I, I kind of agree with that. Um, 
And if you're interested in learning about backyard mushroom cultivation, if you're wanting to look into shiitakes or oyster mushrooms, um, uh, you can follow the Thornhill Garden uh, at the, the Thornhill Gardens Facebook page. And uh, we're hopefully in the next year, um, I am developing the program the or not uh, the program to kind of get the mycological component up and running so we can start uh, doing maybe some uh, workshops on shiitake um, inoculations and other things. Uh, here are several ID reference books. I highly recommend these that are, um, they're no, by no means a uh, comprehensive list, but they're a pretty good list of all the mushrooms uh, that are kind of related to our region. Another really good book that's really a uh, really fascinating read is Mushrooms Demystified. I, it's thick, it's like a thousand pages. Uh, I'm barely through it, um, but uh, I really like uh, the author's writing. Um, and if you have any questions uh, that I have not answered and or um, I haven't answered during the Q&A, um, I have put an email address that you can contact me at. Uh, here. Uh, I also plan on hosting more Mushroom ID hikes in the future. I've done several in the past couple of months, um, but it was mostly I just posted on my Facebook page. I haven't made any events or anything around it. I was just like, hey, come hike with me. Uh, here are some of the references. I just want to let everybody know, unless otherwise noted, uh, most of the, uh, the pictures in the presentation are from uh, my own collection uh, or are being used under a Creative Commons license. And, uh, and those pictures are usually referenced uh, with uh, the content creators and uh, along with the photo. So now we are ready for the Q&A, if anybody has any questions. Yeah. So um, if you want to, if you don't want to ask them yourself, you can always type them in the chat and I can ask them. Uh, otherwise, I believe we've muted everyone. So if you can just unmute yourself uh, when you want to ask a question, uh, kind of as you guys start thinking about what you want to ask. Uh, I was asked by one of our uh, staff members, Stacy. Uh, she had a question for you, Eddie, which is, are there any mushrooms harmful to touch? Anything that you should avoid just touching? <laughs> just touching? No, um, they're not that I know of. Uh, I, usually it's a good, I'm kind of OCD. I wash my hands after I go mushroom hunting just from the general, it's good hygiene practice. Um, uh, but you know, there, there's, I, I don't do it because I'm, you know, I still consider myself a novice, but people even do, um, uh, they will do, uh, they will take a little bit of mushroom, they will even put it in their mouth, they'll get a taste, and then they'll spit it out. It's a taste spit test. I don't recommend it because I haven't done it. I don't do it. I'm not planning on doing it. I haven't been around people who've done it. I've just seen people do it. But the spitting out is the important part. Uh, I don't recommend doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's just covering my own basis. I don't do it myself. Okay. And then Charles asked, where can a person get KOH? Uh, right, so it's it's potassium. lye. Yeah, <laughs> potassium hydroxide. It's lye. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not, there are several um, internet resources where you can actually get the, uh, um, the, the chemical. I haven't actually done it myself, but uh, I think you can maybe even get it um, I don't know if uh, agricultural lye will actually work or not. Uh, usually they use it. Uh, I've seen people say a 2% solution, uh, if you're familiar with chemistry, is what they'll use. Okay. Okay. Anyone else have a question? This Kevin, I've got a question and a comment. Okay. You know, the, the comment is that the, those uh, blue indigos, that 100% bleed blue. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dark blue on all the ones that I've found. Uh, and whenever you do come across them, you're going to come across hundreds of them. Uh, yeah. I, I found them on a, on a hillside, and, and basically they just ran all the way up and down the hillside. Impressive. I'm jealous. 
<laughs> well, it, it's uh, I've only found them in, in uh, really in one spot, but whenever I found them, like I said, I found hundreds of them. Mm. And uh, I, I was going to ask you, have you uh, used the uh, Missouri Department of Conservation's uh, field guide website? They've got a pretty good mushroom. I have um, I have not used that one. I'm a little bit familiar with it. It comes up every so often when I'm searching mushrooms. Um, so they usually have some pretty good pictures on there. So sometimes if I've, if I, their descriptions are not great, but the, but the pictures tend to be good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. Mushrooms are very, it's a very nuanced because you can have a wide variety of morphological features on mushrooms that, uh, you know, so it's one of those things that you need to pay attention to small details, like uh, there's any texture on the stipe, if it's uh, how it attached, how the gills or how uh, the stipe and the cap are attached to one another. You know, it's, there's, um, you know, it, yeah, it, it, having lots of pictures or it's, I can't ex uh, stress that enough to be able to uh, properly ID certain mushrooms. Some need microscopic details. I, I've always gone with the, I always try to use at least three different sources whenever I'm looking at one. So, yeah, I, I, I'm very similar, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. Where did you find the blue mushrooms? Where did the last, um, not you, but the gentleman that was just talking about it? Without Kevin. giving you my precise location, it was in Wayne County on the uh, Little South Fork. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's another thing about mushroom people. Sometimes they're very reluctant to give out locations, specific locations. Uh, you know, that's uh, to either hide their stash or, um, you know, their prized collections or other things like that. But, I'm, you know, I just like sharing this information with other people. Uh, this one was on private properties only. Really. I had permission. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, exactly. but you, you'd have to talk <laughs> to the owner to, to get out there and go through it. Oh, yeah. I was just curious because I've never seen them before and they look incredible. Uh, they're, they're really neat mushrooms. Um, as far as, uh, I know we're not talking about edibility, but they're, they're not the tastiest thing in the world, but, uh, but they are very neat. And, and the, the deep blue that they, ble that they bleed, remember that it's just, it's just really interesting. Yeah. I, I just like the photogenic, uh, like how mushrooms can be photogenic and they're just really cool and how they fill certain roles in uh, the environment and everything. They all, they all have their place. Okay. Uh, any more questions? One thing I wondered if you would talk about is um, your work at the, the Commonwealth Garden and the Thornhill Garden, especially because I know you've just sort of started working at Thornhill. Yeah, so um, if, if any of you are in the Frankfurt area, I do, uh, I do a community garden down at Dolly Graham Park. Uh, it's been that part, that community garden has specifically been going on for uh, since, 2009, 2010. And I just recently in the past three years took over running it to keep it um, operational. And, um, excuse me, and I've been wanting to, uh, essentially I like, I just wanna have, give people an option of being able to participate in gardening, whether or not they have, they in an urban garden specifically. A lot of people in that area, they live in apartments and they don't have um, uh, access to uh, land to uh, uh, plant things. So I did, it's just a little plot of land that uh, the, the parks department has been so gracious in letting us use. Um, and I've uh, been trying to get people involved. So if you're interested in volunteering, we have a Facebook page there as well as the Commonwealth Gardens. Um, I have not been as active there as recently, but I'm hoping to get back started and definitely with winterizing um, uh, oh, the garden. I'll be putting down cover crops soon, actually planting uh, radishes and kale and probably carrots as well. Um, and of course, garlic here soon. 
Um, but, and the Thornhill Garden is actually a collaboration with multiple groups with the Thornhill, Thornhill Education Center, um, the uh, Frankfurt Center for Innovation. Um, they are uh, a maker space in Frankfurt. I highly recommend checking them out, but we've all, uh, we all got together and we are uh, putting together a teaching garden. So this uh, garden will be for, a part of it will be a community garden, but the other part will be actually um, specifically for teaching. Um, and we will be, uh, we have, Thornhill has been really awesome, giving us a lot of resources, and I'm hoping to be able to start teaching um, uh, log inoculation classes um, at this place and even uh, potentially culturing mushrooms uh, there. So. So it's a still ongoing thing. We're in phase one now, which is building raised beds. A lot of the uh, beds will be ADA compliant. Um, you know, they'll be about two feet high. So anybody um, in a wheelchair can access them. Um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, so we're building that and then we're going to phase two next year, which will be the community section, community gardens side. Awesome. I've tried to put in the chat those links to the Facebook page if anyone is interested in them. Oh, okay, thank you. You can, if you still have a question, you can give it, a, a, you can ask it real quick. Um, I just wanted to remind people before you finish heading out that if uh, you were one of our early, um, one of the people that signed up early uh, and you haven't picked up your pamphlet, please remember to do so, or just to like, let me know if you don't want it so I can send it on down to the next person. Um, and I also wanted to let y'all know that uh, we're going to be doing another, it's not really mushroom based, um, but it is at PSPL at the movies. And we're going to be talking about the movie Mushrooms, which is available on Canopy. Uh, it's a dark comedy centered around uh, these two women who uh, accidentally uh, find themselves in possession of the body of a criminal and have to get rid of it. Uh, so we'll talk about that on Thursday if you want to join. And mushrooms are involved. <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask Eddie while uh, we're still here? All right. Only once. Only twice. All right. Okay. So we're going to close on down for the night, but thank you so much um, for being here. Thank you for, uh, for giving us this presentation, Eddie. It was great. I know I learned so much and I thought it was fantastic. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for uh, coming out and, uh, and I want to thank the Paul Sawyer Library and uh, Cindy for uh, hosting uh, the programs like this. It's definitely a great, the Paul Sawyer Library has always been, a, you know, a staple in the community. And I love being a part of it. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to head out now. You all have a great night. Yeah. All right. Well, take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.